Church, it is such a privilege to stand before you this morning, as has been mentioned, to celebrate the 54th year of this congregation's time together. We're so grateful that you've chosen to be with us this morning. And before we get started, I want to kind of give you an outline of what we're going to be doing together this morning in our time together. During this period of time in our message, if you have a copy of your Bible study outline, I would encourage you to take that out at this time. You're going to see on the back side uh, our Bible study outline and our weekly newsletter. You're going to find the sermon notes. Now, we're going to be dealing with the first half of this morning's message during this time together. And then once our worship assembly has concluded and our Bible class gets underway, we'll be looking at the second half of this psalm, Psalm 51. So again, the title for this morning, as Charles mentioned, Renew, Rebuild, and Restore, Psalm 51. Now let's say this morning, you've drifted away from God. You've left home, the place where your relationship with God flourishes. And instead, you're living in a wasteland. You are surrounded daily by the reality of your own sinfulness. But now that you've come to your senses and you recognize at this moment the absolute mess that you have made out of your life, you begin to wonder, can I come home again? Will God ever accept me back? Or, or, or does God just kick you to the curb when you've gone too far? We're going to learn the answer to that question together here in Psalm 51. In fact, in Psalm 51, we know the exact context of how and why the psalm was written. Why? Because it's actually written at the very beginning. It is the inspired preface of the psalm. If you look in your Bible or your Bible app, and I want to encourage you to keep your Bibles here in Psalm 51, you're going to notice a heading which says this, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. So church, let me tell you, this is David's confessional psalm written after he had committed adultery, after he had murdered Uriah, and after he had returned back to God. This is what he wrote. Let me ask you, church, how would you like, think about it, how would you like your confession of something like this to be read for the whole world to see after you had sinned in a manner such as this. I mean, just think about it, right? But this is the psalm that God has given us, which will answer the question, how do you get right when you've gone so wrong? How can your life truly be renewed, rebuilt, and restored? You see, I stand before you knowing that there are some of us, even in this very room this morning, even as Christians, we're still trying to answer that question. We're not sure yet how it is that God can truly renew my life or rebuild my life or restore my life. And we're struggling this morning. I know. I've been where you are. But let me set this entire situation up for you because... Again, we know that the context of Psalm 51 is actually found in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. You have King David. He's God's man. He's the anointed one. You might call him the golden boy. He's the giant killer. He's the one who has restored worship back to the people of God. And David, one day, 
He's in his palace, and it's quite interesting because it's early in the evening, and folks, think about it. David is just now getting out of bed. Think about that for just a moment. He's walking around the roof of his palace, and he peers out, looks out over his kingdom, and as he looks around, he sees this one particular house, a woman's there. Her husband is gone. He's actually one of David's mighty men. He's out in the field fighting David's battles. And his wife, by the way, is a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And Bathsheba is stripped of her clothing at the moment and is taking a bath. And David sees her, and he does not look away. He kept looking. You think about it. He's got the power. He's got the authority. He's the king. And so he sends his servant and says, Hey, I want you to bring her to me. So she comes. He has a one-night stand with her. Done thinks it's all over. But then a few weeks go by, and, and she sends word. What does she say? David, I'm pregnant. David goes, oh man, I'm in trouble. I, I've got to cover up what I've done. So he brings in her husband, Uriah, from the field, and he says, hey, Uriah, how's the battle going? Uriah's like, David, it's going awesome. David says, hey, I want to commend you for the great work that you're doing as one of my mighty men. And you know what? Since you're doing such a great job, you're, I'm going to give you time away from the war to enjoy your wife. But Uriah says, King, I, I can't do that. I mean, think about it, David. Uh, all of my men, they're out in the field. They're out in the night air. How can I go and be home with my wife knowing that my men are by themselves in the field? David says, Uriah, listen to me, man. You're such an honorable guy. Hey, you know what? Why don't you sit down with me and let's have a drink together? And so David starts to try to get Uriah drunk. And they drink, and they drink, and they drink. And sure enough, Uriah becomes drunk. And David thinks, I've got him right where I want him. His decision-making is clouded. And so he says, Uriah, go home. Spend this time with your wife. But Uriah still refuses the king's request. Because you see, church, at this moment, Uriah drunk is more noble than King David sober. And so what does David do? He, he takes the next wrong step, right? He writes a secret message to the general and he seals it and he gives it to Uriah and Uriah takes the orders to the general and David's orders say, put Uriah in the front of the line in the midst of the most heated battle and then withdraw from him until he dies. The general carries out David's orders. And the message comes back to Jerusalem saying, King David, sadly, Uriah has died in battle. To which David responds with such emotion, Oh, what a tragedy! One of my mighty men has died in battle. 
Oh, and, and look at look at poor Uriah's widow over there. I'm such a good man. I'm, I'm going to take her in and I'm going to be the one to take care of her. I'm going to make her my wife. David marries Bathsheba. Their child is born. And David thinks, okay, I've covered it up. Nobody knows. God knows. God knows. And God knows this morning whatever it is that you're going through. So God sends a preacher to David. You know, God sends a preacher to you. And the preacher at that time was this guy by the name of Nathan the prophet. Now, every time I read this story of Nathan the prophet, my mind kind of goes back and I can't help but think about this bumbling detective I used to watch as a kid on TV on WBTM Channel 42 back in Alabama, a TV show by the name of Columbo. Anybody remember that show? I mean, this guy was a blooming idiot, but some way, somehow he got everybody to confess what they'd done wrong. That's exactly what's happening here. You see, you have Nathan the prophet and he comes to see King David. And he says, King, I've got this problem and it's really hard. I can't seem to figure this thing out. And David, I need your input on this. and It's got me stumbled. So King David's like, sure, sure, Nathan. What do you need? Well, David, this is the crazy story. Listen, you see, there's this really poor family. I mean, David, they can barely survive. They have one animal, one single, solitary little lamb. And, and, and David, they've sort of domesticated this lamb. It's sort of become like family to them. I mean, even the kids sleep with a lamb. They eat with a lamb. It's crazy. And David, you know, David says, that's adorable, by the way, because I love sheep. Nathan goes, yeah, I know you do. But David, here's the sad part of the story. You see, David, there's this man that lives right down the road. He's a rich man, and David, he has got a whole flock of sheep. And he, he had some guests to come by, and he knew that he needed to prepare a meal for his guests. But instead of taking one of the lambs from his mighty flock, he sends a servant out in the middle of the night. And that servant sneaks into the bedroom where the children are sleeping and snatches that lamb out of their bedroom and wakes them up and scares them half to death. And he brings that lamb back home to the rich man and they slay the lamb and kill it and serve it at the meal. Such a tragedy. King David, tell me something. What do you think should happen to that man? Folks, David is mad. He is incensed. He stands up and says, that man deserves to what? die. And Nathan says what? Repeat it with me. You are the man. Let me tell you something, church. King David knew in that very moment, without a doubt, I'm busted. He knew that everything that he held dear, think about it, his reputation, 
His integrity. He's the singer of God's people. He's the king. He's the noble one. His family, his kingdom, it's all at risk. It's all shattering before him. Why? Because his hypocrisy has been exposed. So let me ask you, church, what do you do when you hit the wall like David just did? Can you return to God? Psalm 51 is David's confessional response. And let me tell you, church, before you dismiss any of these words this morning, let me tell you, it should be our confessional response as well. You see, you and I are going to respond to sin in one of two ways. Either one, you will repeat it, or number two, you will repent. Repeat or repent. Let me tell you something I've learned a long time ago. Maybe you already know this. I'm sure many of you do. If you repeat a sin long enough, you know what happens to the guilt? The guilt goes bye-bye. It's either repent or repeat. Well, thankfully, King David chose to repent. Otherwise, we don't have Psalm 51 this morning. And it's the very same thing for you and me. If we are going to return to God, if we're going to experience being renewed, rebuilt, and restored, there has to be a homecoming. So the initial step, if you have your Bible study outline here on your screen, the initial step is... Repentance. Write that down, if you will. And when you take on a heart of repentance, church, there comes a moment in your life where you must come to terms with your own sinfulness. Repentance requires, number one, being honest about your sin. Beginning in verse 1, read this with me. Psalm 51, verse 1. David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your Abundant mercy blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Repeatedly, if you read that with me, you heard three words. I, me, Mine. It's me. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer, as the old song would say. I'm the one. God, I'm the one at fault. See, David doesn't do like modern politicians, right? You see, modern politicians, they get caught and they say, well, it wasn't my fault. I mean, after all, it was Bathsheba's fault. I mean, she was the naked one. I'm the victim here. Wow, if you think about it, in today's life, everybody's a victim. Am I right, church? No, David, he, he doesn't do that, though. He comes clean. He didn't make any excuses. He didn't do what we tend to do and minimize. He didn't say, well, you know, I've got this condition, or I made a little mistake. I got a little sidetracked. No, instead, church... He calls sin what it is. It's evil. It's wrong. Folks, just imagine David in this moment. He's literally a broken man. 
Think about it. Just a few moments ago, he's on that palace rooftop and he's looking out over his entire kingdom thinking, I'm in control. This is all mine. I can tell anybody what to do and they'll do it because I am king. And now he is laying down on a cold floor crying out to God. And I'm going to tell you something, church, if you don't realize it already, that's where you and I need to be sometimes. There are four things here that stands out to me so vividly. And the manner in which King David describes sin. Four descriptions of sin, and I want you to jot them down on your Bible study outline. Follow along. Let's take these together and put them into our hearts so that we know truly what sin is because you cannot even begin to repent if you do not acknowledge your own sinfulness. The first thing I want to talk about this morning, sin, it is breaking God's law. David says what? Look at verse 1 and verse 3. Verse 1, David says, blot out my transgressions. He says, I know my transgressions. In other words, he's standing in the courtroom of God Almighty and he's saying out loud to everyone who can hear him, I'm guilty. Then he describes it in a second way. It is filthiness. It is filthiness. Look at verse 2 and verse 7. When I think about it, church, it just really stands out to me. The, the words that David the psalmist uses here, words like this, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my evil. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. David says, because of our sin, Church, we've now got a stain that we cannot remove ourselves. You can take all the bleach that exists in this world and you will not be able to remove the stain of sin from your life. You ever bought OxyClean? Even OxyClean won't remove the stain of sin. Why? Because this stain is not on your clothing. Where is it, church? It's on your heart. You see, your heart has become corrupted. It's unclean. But then David gives us the third image of what sin is. Look at this, verse 9. It is a debt. I've told you this as we've been in our Jesus Is series over the last few months. Sin is a debt that we cannot pay. I mean, in fact, if you really want to know the very central definition, that's what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is canceling the debt. Okay, so think about it. When we ask for forgiveness, we're asking God to cancel the debt that is against us. Because in reality... Every one of us have got a stack of unpaid bills. I remember when I was 18 years old and I went off to college, I got my first mailbox at the college. Still remember even the number. And I had only been a college student for just a few months when I went to my mailbox one day and there was an invitation to accept something in that mailbox. Do you know what that was? A credit card. Mmm, free money, right? And I got that credit card and I went and I bought food and groceries and whatever I could spend. And then, you know what happened? They sent me a bill. And I didn't have the money to pay that bill. 
And, and so that debt began to stack up until you know who they sent to me? A bill collector. And that bill collector calls me up and says, Mr. Sanford, you know that you owe us this money, right? And I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the money to pay you right now. And they said, we don't care. I'm not the only person in this room that ever went through that, right? We all know what it's like to owe something that we cannot pay back. You think, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Well, in this case, when it comes to our sin debt, without Jesus Christ, we would be condemned guilty and we would be cast away. Why? Because we have this debt. David says, blot out my transgressions. Remove the debt from my account. Now, fourth, David tells us this about sin. It is treacherous. Treasonous, excuse me. What does David say here? He says in verse 4, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. See, church, David knows that our sin, I don't use this phrase very often, but I'm going to use it this morning. Our sin is cosmic treason against God. David knew this. Church, before David ever sinned against Bathsheba, before David ever sinned against Uriah, before David ever sinned against the entire nation of Israel, he first and foremost sinned against who? God. And any time that you and I sin. It is treasonous against God. It's like, and I can't even imagine it, it's like walking up to God and slapping Him in the face and saying, I want to rule my life. I want to be the king of my life, not you, God. I mean, stop and think about it. Let's just be honest with another. Have you ever thought how many of the Ten Commandments David has broken in this particular situation? At least five of the ten, right? First commandment, you are to have no other gods before me. David says, no, I want to be my own God, right? That's number one. The second commandment is, you shall have no idols in your life. David says, no, I want sex to be my idol. The 10th commandment says, you shall not covet what your neighbor has, nor his wife. David says, no, I want her to be for myself. The Bible says, you shall not commit uh, adultery. David says, well, I don't care what you say, God. The Bible says you shall not murder. David says, listen, I know the Bible says that, but I needed to cover up my sin. David has literally committed all this cosmic treason against Almighty God. He knows he is guilty. He knows he is unclean. He knows he has a debt he cannot pay. And he knows he has committed cosmic treason against God. So church, what's he going to do? does one of the hardest things that any of us in this room will ever do. He confesses. See, brothers and sisters, if you want healing, the first thing you've got to do is admit you're broken. If you want cleansing, then the first thing you've got to do is come clean. If you want forgiveness, You've got to repent. 
Now there's an incredible contrast here because this story starts off, David's up on the rooftop proclaiming, I'm the king, telling people what to do, and now he's this broken, broken man. And that's what the first nine verses of Psalm 51 teach us. David is broken before Almighty God, and that's where God will have us to be at times ourselves. But before we close up this first half of today's message, let me tell you I've got good news for you. God will break us. We will hit rock bottom. But when you eventually hit rock bottom, let me tell you what you discover at the bottom. God's grace. Praise the Lord for His grace and His loving kindness. Now we're going to sing together this song of encouragement this morning. Maybe you are broken. Maybe you are miserable. Maybe you are hurting. Maybe it's because of the own sin ridden life that you have allowed yourself to become on a daily basis. You are like David, you're laying on the floor every day crying out, God, I am a broken, miserable person. The first step is to repent and confess the sinfulness in your own life. But I'm going to tell you what, church, you know how many stones we have available to throw at each other this morning? Do you know how many? Not a single one. So if you need the prayers of this church family to help you out this morning, we can serve you in any manner, whether it's through prayer for forgiveness or you need to put on Christ in your life. Let us lovingly care for you as we stand and sing together. How's everybody feeling? I have really thoroughly enjoyed seeing so many of you here with us this morning, especially our guests. We are delighted that you have chosen to be with us this morning. How many of you still have a copy of your Bible study outline? Raise that up if you do. All right, that's wonderful. So this is a Bible class format, and i love to have your feedback as we continue in this lesson this morning. But first and foremost, let me ask you, how many of you, how many of you, Psalm 51 is one of your favorite passages or favorite uh, chapters of Scripture? How many of you? Yeah. Why do you think it is, class, that so many of us are attracted to Psalm 51? Hope? The need of grace. The need of grace. God's arms are always open. I like that. Anybody got any other ideas? Alan? Drives home who I am really sinning against. I, I like that, Alan. Very wise perspective. Church, I want to begin today's Bible class by asking you, aren't you thankful that even when we sin, that there is the grace of Almighty God to restore us? That's the second part of today's lesson from Psalm 51. Let me remind you, the first part was repentance, right? Coming clean. So you might be wondering, what's the second part? The next step, as you're going to see on the screen, is restoration. Restoration. I was just talking with some of our guests with us this morning and about the story about the credit cards and, and uh, 
I didn't finish the story. You wonder what happened with the debt that I racked up? It took me like six years to pay it off. Yeah. Because four years in school, I was broke. And then, you know, it, it, my parents were not the kind of parents to bail me out. Their mindset was, you've gotten yourself into this mess. You can get yourself out, right? Boy, I'm, I'm grateful that God does not take that mindset with us when it comes to sin. You got yourself into this mess. God doesn't say, well, you got to get yourself out of it. No, He lovingly guides us into restoration. I'm so thankful that we serve a God who is not only righteous, but a God who is forgiving. A God who forgives and cleanses us and changes us. But here's the deal. You see, when God, when we repent, it's not that God just forgives us. See, a lot of us in the church, we have this mindset that we sin, we repent, God forgives us, and it's all said and done. But that's not the way it works with God. You see, God wants us to change. He doesn't want us just to stay where we are. See, what God wants to do is change us into a different kind of person. So let me ask you, class, how many of you are different today than you were, say, one year ago? Many of you are different today than you were five years ago. And many of you are different today than you were 20 years ago, right? You see, we like to believe that we're consistent creatures. We like to believe that we've got it all under our control and we're just moving at the pace that we so desire. Nothing is ever going to upset the apple cart of who we are. But the reality is we are constantly changing. Now, there are two ways that we can change. Either the world will change us. Either the world will change us. Or God will change us. Who do you want to change your class? So the second main consideration here in Psalm 51 is this. It's number two on your outline. We're going to be talking about turning your eyes towards God's forgiveness. <clears throat> now I have a little, I have two little chihuahuas at home. They're not the yap, yap, yap at your feet kind of chihuahuas. How many of you have ever known a chihuahua like that? Right, you walk up, they want to bite your ankles. Right, <laughs> I just can't deal with with dogs like that. But I love Chihuahuas, so I learned a long time ago how to train Chihuahuas. But Chihuahuas have a personality that's quite unique when it comes to their sense of guilt. When a Chihuahua will do something wrong, something they know their master would not have them do, they turn their eyes. They look away. You see, we're a lot like that with God. A lot of us, when we sin, we feel the stain of guilt. And what do our eyes do? We want to look anywhere else than God. Isn't it amazing that it's been that way since the very beginning? Adam and Eve sin in the garden. Who was the last person they wanted to lock eyes with, class? God. But I want you to notice this morning that when God restores you, when your eyes are truly focused on His forgiveness, 
class, he's going to accomplish four very essential things in your life. And, and let me tell you, class, you can't truly exist. You cannot truly survive this Christian walk without these four things. Sadly, a lot of us try to, though. So let's discover what these are. Number one here on this list, the first thing that will happen when you turn your eyes towards God's forgiveness, God will change your heart. I imagine that most of us in this room could, by memory, quote Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Say it with me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Did you know that the word that is used here in Psalm 51, verse 10, is the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God, what? Created. It's as if David is saying here in verse 10, God, there is something that is not existing. And that is my heart. My heart's not right with you, God. I've got a heart that is wayward. I've got a heart that's messed up. I've got a heart that's not even close to faithful. And I, I really hope and pray that we will learn, as David did, to ask God this question. God, Will you change my heart? How many of you have ever prayed that in your life? Don't raise your hand, just think about it. How many of you have ever prayed, God, would you please change my heart? If you will do that, I think you'll be shocked at what a difference it'll make in your life. And it's the same way that God likes to change us. Why? <laughs> because temptation. Let me ask you, class, you answer me this question. Is temptation going away anytime soon? No. Sin and temptation are like a beach ball. You ever been in a pool or out in the ocean, you take a beach ball, and you push it under the water, and you let go, what happens? Pops right back up again, doesn't it? I mean, you can keep pushing that beach ball down time after time again, and it's always just going to keep popping up. And, and so, class, what do we most often do? I've heard this said a thousand times in my own life. Not just me, but by my friends, my family, my co-workers, people I'm acquainted with. They'll say, and I'll say, you know what? I'm going to turn over a new leaf. You ever said that? But you know, the truth is, commitment only goes so far, doesn't it? And the fact is, only God is capable, only His Holy Spirit is capable of changing us from the inside out. How do we like to do it? We like to change from the outside in new clothes, right? If, if we look a certain way and we want to change, what do we do, class? 
You go out and buy new clothes, don't you? You stink. You take a bath, hopefully, right? You put on deodorant. You see, we're all about the outside. Let me ask you this question. How many of you looked in the mirror this morning? Raise your hand. Some of you didn't. That's okay. <laughs> it's sort of like this boy, and I love this story. I've heard it a million times. It's sort of like this boy who promised his mother that he was going to save his money during the week to put it in the collection of church. And every week, he would do so good on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Man, he was hitting a home run. He was saving his money. He was excited. He was going to put it in the plate at church on Sunday. But every Saturday, there would be this little noise that would come through his neighborhood. It was an ice cream truck. And every Saturday, he would spend all of his money on ice cream. This happened for two or three weeks in a row. So one Friday night, before bed, his mother heard him praying, Oh God, please keep the ice cream truck from coming down our street tomorrow. i got to tell you something. The ice cream truck's going to keep on coming. Now, what is your temptation? I don't know what your temptation is. Maybe your temptation is ice cream. I, I, I don't know. But the fact is, that temptation is going to keep on coming. And so you can either wisely think, I've got to have an outside source of power, or you can keep on thinking every time you fall into the same trap, well, next time I'm going to do better. But the reality is you need a change of heart. You need a right spirit. You need God to create something in you. I like to put it this way. And this has been something in my life that especially over the last decade, I've really come to real realization of. I need God to change my want to's. My want to's. And God says, if you will repent and seek me, I will change your heart. I'll create something that doesn't presently exist in you. I'll give you a new heart. I will give you a right spirit. That's the first thing that God does when he restores us. But what about the second thing? God will restore your joy. Look at verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Verse 12. Restore to me the what? Restore to me the what? One more time, restore to me the what? Class David is saying, God, I once had a joyful relationship with you, but I drifted away, and now my joy has vanished. I asked you a moment ago, are you willing to pray that God would change your heart? Let me ask you, are you willing to say that prayer today? But what about this next one? Will you be willing to pray, God, will you please, please restore my joy? Can 
God, would you please do this for me? It's amazing here, class. He's saying, God, you have crushed my bones. That's what guilt does. Especially guilt from above. It will crush you. God, you have crushed my bones. Now make them rejoice. Now, let me put it back on you for a moment. Will God allow you, class, to feel the consequences of your sin? Yes or no? Let's try that again. Will God allow you to feel the consequences of your sin? Yes. Why? Why do you think that is, class? Your turn. You answer. Why would God allow you to feel and face the consequences of sin in your life? Okay, that's the simple answer. So you won't do it again. But is that the only reason? Is it just so that you'll turn back to Him? What else? What's that? Keep you humble? Okay. You can only rise above your opposition? Okay. It sure is. That's right. The reason why God will allow you to feel the consequences of your sin is because God doesn't want you to keep in your sin. If you never felt the stain of guilt or the consequence of sin, if no one in this room, including myself, ever felt the guilt or the stain or the consequence of sin, let's be honest with each other. What would we do? We just keep on doing it. God will allow you to feel the pain. And here's why the ultimate biggest answer I can give you is that God cares more about your holiness than He does your happiness. That's a hard one to swallow sometimes. And here's the reality. There is a pathway to joy, but that pathway starts with repentance. That is the first step of the journey. See, we've got the wrong image in our mind of repentance. We somehow think, okay, following Jesus, man, it's drudgery, it's hard, and oh my goodness, following Jesus is so joyless. And, and no, that's the biggest lie. The ultimate joy killer is sin. And if you want to be restored, the first step is repentance. That is the way back to joy. Think about it for a moment, class. Do you realize that David, for the last year of his life, had been living a double life? You ever stop to think about it? For around a year, he has been living a double life. And it's been a joyless life. Yeah, I mean, he still went through all the motions. Think about it. Every Sabbath, he'd go to the synagogue or the temple, and he'd be a part of the worship. But when he would be a part of that worship, something felt off, didn't it? The singing didn't sound quite right. Maybe he thought, well, the song leader this morning, he ain't that good anymore. Uh, I don't know what's going on with our singing here inside the synagogue today. Or, you know, Nathan, the preacher man, he used to, every Sunday, Nathan would hit home runs. But now, there's just something off with Nathan. There was nothing off with the worship going on in the synagogue. There was nothing wrong with the preaching. What was wrong? David's heart lacked what? Joy. Because the joy is gone. Like the song says, the thrill is gone. Right? Why? Because when you're all out of sorts with God and you're in sin, there's no joy there. Yeah, you may have a temporary thrill, but there's no real joy. 
and the joy of David's life is gone. He says, Oh God, please restore to me what? The joy of my salvation. Let me ask you, class. Do you know any joyless Christians? Do you know any grumpy Christians? Don't you look at your neighbor, please. Ooh. Ooh. Woo. I'll step down and let you finish. But the truth is, they exist, right? I believe that there are joyless Christians or grumpy Christians that exist today for one of two reasons. First reason I can think of is that they've never really truly dedicated their lives to following Jesus. Maybe they've been going through the motions, but they've never really said, it's time to really put myself into Jesus' hands. But maybe second, and I think this is probably the true answer, I think the reason why there's so many miserable Christians is that they are living every day with unconfessed sin in their life. I like to say it this way, and you might write this down if you think it helps you. Unexpressed repentance is inexperienced joy. Unexpressed repentance is inexperienced joy. If you want joy, it comes through repentance. I mean, you really and truly got to come clean with God. And so God says, okay, when I restore you, I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to give you your joy back. But is he done right there? Is it all he does? No. Look at the next thing. God will use your experience. I like to say it this way. God will take your struggles and use them to help fellow strugglers. You see, we're all strugglers in here. Pay attention to how he says this in verse 13. Look at this with me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And what does he say next? And sinners will return to you. David says, now that I've been restored, I want to witness to other strugglers your grace, your kindness, your forgiveness, your mercy. God, you've forgiven me, and I want to share with others the amazing forgiveness of the grace of Almighty God. It's like this. Whenever God has done something real in your life, He's giving you a testimony. Now, I know I grew up in the Church of Christ, and a lot of people in the Church of Christ don't like to use the word testimony. But your testimony is simply sharing what you've experienced, what God has done in your life. And there is nothing unscriptural about sharing the grace of Almighty God. The right time... When the time is appropriate, you need to testify. It saddens me that um, people very seldom hear us talk about how God has restored us. I don't want to pick on anybody in this room, 
But I, I do know there are people in this church that I've gotten to know over the last five and a half years that do this. They, they are ashamed of who they were. They don't like who they were, but they sure know how powerful it is to tell people where God has brought them today. Maybe that's you. Don't be ashamed to share that because we don't need another evangelism tool in our box because right here, what David is talking about is one of the most effective, powerful evangelism tools that exists in the world today. Some of you are living examples of that. Praise God for you. And one of the greatest benefits of being restored by God is that you now have a story to share with other people. How many of you are married here this morning? Has your marriage always been perfect? Has your, has your marriage ever been on the rocks? And God saved your marriage? Why did He save your marriage? So He can use your experience to help out other marriages. Has God ever delivered you from an addiction in your life? If He's done so, He's done so He, so he can use your story to help others who are going through addiction. God wants to use you. I like to put it this way. If you've ever experienced a time of test, God wants you to know you now have a testimony. But you know, Satan does write the opposite. What does Satan tell us, class? Hopeless. When we drift away from God, Satan says, you'll never be any different than you are right now. Am I right? He'll say, and I've heard this one, God can never use somebody like you. Or maybe he says, you've gone too far. You've been too wayward. And, and the most powerful lie that Satan keeps telling people in my church is that God will never use a broken person like you. Satan has the worst accusatory voice that's ever existed in this world. But class, I want you to realize something. We are studying a psalm written by a man who committed adultery and murder. And if God can restore that man... He can restore you. That's hope. Who said that over here? Who said hope earlier? Phil. That's hope. God wants to use your experience. God wants to use your story. But here's the final thing, and then the message is yours. God will fill you with worship. For 30 years, I'm just estimating here. 30 years, David has been the writer of all these amazing psalms. Most of the psalms here in the book of Psalms are written by David. But I want you to think about it. Over the past year of hypocrisy and sin, you know what's not been happening? David hadn't been writing any psalms. Especially not any joyful ones. I mean, what did David do with his harp? 
It's in the storage closet. Has David been doing a lot of singing? A lot of dancing? Has he been doing a lot of passionate worship? I can just imagine, because listen, if you had been around David for all this time, before this sin, and then you see David during and after this sin, I guarantee you his servants were thinking, what's wrong? This isn't the King David we've known. I mean, there's no new psalms of praise. Do you know why that is? Class, sin silences your worship. You can't sing sweet songs of Zion when you're sitting here on a Sunday morning with unconfessed sin, riddling your heart with guilt. And so, after David gets broken by Almighty God and God restores him, I want you to pay attention to how he concludes this psalm. Verse 15, what does he say? O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will what? Declare your praise. Here's David. He's this man who is broken. He's lying on the floor crying out, Have mercy on me, O God. He's just, I mean, he's confessing before God. God restores him and lifts him up, stands David up, and now he has a song of praise that he's going to sing. And, and it's amazing to me, if you've ever studied the Psalms, you're going to find out in the book of Psalms that the other Psalms written after this event consistently declare God's goodness and His grace. You see, the reality is if you don't repent consistently, you will not worship passionately. Let me say it again. If you don't repent consistently, you will not worship passionately. If you're a Christian this morning and you are struggling to exude passionate worship, it's not the song leader's fault. It's not the prayer leader's fault. It's not the person presiding over communion. It's not the preacher's fault. In most cases, you know whose fault it is that we don't experience passionate worship? I think you know the answer. Folks, repentance is a key to worship. That's why here at Waters Road Church of Christ, we do everything we can, whether it's in our worship assembly or our Bible classes. We do everything we can to make sure we are preaching and teaching the Word of God. Jerry, do I sometimes preach hard sermons? You step on my toes all the time. You know what I was told when I was 15 years old by Brother Flavel Nichols? He told me, Jerry, he said, soft sermons create hard hearts. I was 15 years old. And that blew me away. And then he told me, Jonathan, hard sermons create soft hearts. And I want you to be exposed to the Word of God so that God can cleanse your heart. Got five minutes. So that's what's going on with David. He heard a hard sermon, didn't he? And I love the illustration that David, the prophet, or Nathan the prophet used, right? I mean, what a convicting illustration. You are the man. You know, if you think you're going to hide something from God, class, 
Guess what? You're not. Look again at how this psalm starts off. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. Why? According to your what? Steadfast love. David starts off saying, I'm stained, I'm guilty, I have all these debts, I have all this cosmic treason that I've committed against you, but I know this, God, I know you, that you hate sin, but I also know, God, that you are forgiving. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Now, you may be thinking right now, uh, Jonathan, how do I know? How do I know that God will forgive me of my treason? If you look at the bottom of your Bible study outline, I'm going to leave you with this Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. This is all the proof that you need. What does it say? God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us.